All right, welcome to episode 111 of the Party of Slate podcast. We are back at it another week. I'm your host, Anthony. I'm joined, as always, every single week, Tony, Nate. How are you gentlemen doing? Yo, yo, I'm doing great. Not every week, but I'm happy to be back. And yes, <laughs> oh, you missed God. one week, Nate. I mean, God. <laughs> I mean, it stings for me, but yes, one, one, one. If you're one, 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 then I'm nerd, nerd, nerd. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we. Uh, <laughs> you missed one week, and we even. I mean, the week that you missed, we we talked to Mike Hartsfield a couple weeks back. You missed that one, just the conversation, but you were on the episode, so we I know. found a way to. We always find a way because that that seat is yours. It's like show regret. Like, ah, fuck, dude. I tried everything. Like, I literally was speeding home because couldn't do it. And like, I was fucking bummed. But yeah, smart did though. Get you to... didn't get in an accident and you got, you know, yeah. you got a family. We don't, we don't need any of that crap. I know. All right. Safety. The, the nerd seat's always warm. We'll be back at it as we, uh, as we are. And this is probably dropping a couple of days earlier than we usually do because we had, I don't know, one of the bigger, for us, nerdery guests that we've ever had, right? Yeah. A badass name, a badass dude. We had Sergio Vega from uh, Quicksand and uh, Deftones fame. What a fucking cool dude. Uh, we're big fans of all the music that he's put out. He's doing some production work too. And uh, yeah, he came on and just geeked out with us basically. And um, obviously fresh off the press, recently left Deftones uh, as a collaborator. So I uh, got into that a little bit. And uh, Quicksand, that legacy, and um, everything in, in between. So it was a pleasure to talk with this guy. I never thought we'd, we'd get him on. So this was a, this was a big one for us. Right on. We're going to get into it right now with Sergio Vega. Hey guys, Tony here. If you like what you hear, go back and listen to some of our other interviews. We had Frank Maddox, the VP of Creative at Warner, who's a longtime collaborator with Deftones. Brian Fair of Shadows Fall. Phil Lipscomb of Taproot. Tucker Rule of Thursday, who we talk about a little bit with Sergio coming up here. Uh, and, you know, all this stuff is on PatioSlave.com. We've had a bunch of interviews, a bunch of cool conversations between the three of us, new podcast friends, all kinds of stuff back there. So PatioSlave.com or at PatioSlave on all of the social media platforms. Thank you. All right. We are here with the one, the only Sergio Vega. Sergio, we appreciate you hanging out with us this afternoon. And it is an afternoon, which is rare for us, usually at night. How are uh, you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you, Anthony and Tony and Daniel. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Having a good, you know, it's, uh, spring starting to finally make its way out in New York and mm -hmm. just kind of enjoying the vibe and enjoying just living life. Nice. Yeah, we can relate being up in Maine. Well, two thirds of us up in Maine, um, but we're we're huge Quicksand fans, Legacy Deftones fans throughout the years. Quicksand Slip is, uh, it's. I would say if there's, of the guests we've had on this podcast, if there's one record that comes up the most from our guests, it's Slip. Yep. Oh, cool. We did a comfort food uh, album episode in Tucker Rule of Thursday without hesitation. Quicksand Slip. That's awesome. I mean, he's such a, he's a sweet dude. He's a talented dude. And he is, he presents himself just well in life. Like he yeah. just always looks good. And he's nice and his family and everything. And just, you know, like any chance I get to be around him is always, it's always uplifting. Yeah. Tucker, Tucker was a lot of fun. We talked to him before Christmas last year and then saw him here in Maine and, and dude is a beast behind the kit. So oh, he is. I mean, yeah, without a doubt, without a doubt. And, and Thursday is a great band and they're all friends and, you know, quicksand got to do a small run with them in Australia a couple of years ago. Nice. And, oh, nice. So, yeah, I like touring with bands because you get to know the, a little bit more about them. And I think for people like, yeah, like seeing the Revelation poster behind you, you value knowing people, the community. You know, you're, you're from a place and a scene where like knowing the bands and knowing the people really help in terms of just kind of understanding where people are coming from and appreciating them on that level. I think that's what makes people like us gravitate towards the kind of music that we do. Mm -hmm. Yep, I would agree with that for sure. So, Sergio, a little inside baseball here. I did have a quicksand manic compression poster behind me about a week ago. And then we, you know, learned that we we're going to talk with you. And I'm like, you know, I'm not going to be that guy that has a poster <laughs> of the guy I'm talking to behind me. So I'm going to swap it out. Oh, well, you know, Revelation is like uh, our first home. So I appreciate seeing that. It makes me feel right on. Makes me feel good. <laughs> yeah. Don't wear the band t-shirt to the concert kind of thing. Exactly, that type of thing. <laughs> I'm the guy who wears his own band shirt, so. Oh, okay. I should have done it then. I've been known to wear a Patio Slave hat, so it happens, right? <laughs> you know, Got to rep it. I mean, why not? 
So speaking of repping, uh, recently you were at the Grammy Awards, which is pretty crazy. Uh, we've never gone, obviously. So talking to you, checking that out, we're just curious. You know, we, we've never seen the inner workings of the Grammys, but uh, there's rumors on on the little kind of tidbits, like the basket. Like everyone gets a little gift gift bag. Like what's in that gift bag? Yes. My wife and I went to the Grammys together and we got nice. two gift bags and they were filled with all vegan uh, facial creams and toners and pretty good stuff, actually. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It worked really well. Yeah. We saw the photo of you uh, with the Grammy on the red carpet uh, looking very oh, dapper in your suit. It looked oh, like yeah. I was actually holding a Grammy. It was just behind me and I just yeah, kind of- It was legit. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it was an amazing experience, you know. Having the opportunity to go there, having uh, compositions that that I'm a part of creating and recording, you know, it'd be be honored in that way is it was the first time, and it was something that really still means a lot to me. Mm -hmm. And it was an event that that I, I really cherished. You know, I it, I didn't get into music thinking Grammys, thinking anything, get into music to get into music, but at that point in my career to have something that I'm proud of be acknowledged in that way by, by any sort of body, you know, was, was a very nice thing. And nice. as far as the inner workings are concerned, the people behind it, the people at the recording Academy were, were so nice and they responded so quick to anything, any emails, any texts. And I can imagine how many people were probably hitting them up, but any time there was a, a any need for exchange or information, they would reach, me in seconds so it was my first grammy and i know it was the first time in las vegas so i think it was a bit different for people who had mm. experienced multiple ones but and i had my wife and i had the time of our lives nice that's awesome that's awesome we actually had a, another question kind of associated with that because we had another guy on here greg bergdorf from, from the band zebrahead he was uh nominated for actually i think they won right they got a grammy yeah uh, when they helped lemmy from motorhead record re-record a, a motorhead song Cool. He was kind of telling us some cool backstory. Do you remember like where you were, like where, like where you were, where you got the call for the Grammy nomination? Home, I was home, and uh, just nice. kind of kicking it at home. I have like, uh, like you can see behind me, I have like a, uh, a like a little home set recording setup, and obviously we're we're still kind of dealing with the aftermath and and really still being in the pandemic to a certain extent, and we're just kind of home mostly, and and just working on music and working on things and and getting that email actually wait when i got the official call that's how that happened when i got the, the email actually nice. but strangely enough i was at uh, a convention with my wife and it was it was an anime con convention that she was uh she was a guest at and someone came up to me and said yeah congratulations on that on the grammy and i was like what oh, you, nice what, what are you talking about you know i was like it was like a like a an acquaintance who's like a DJ and he was, I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And then <laughs> shortly thereafter, uh, I got the email. I was, it was a really nice surprise. It's interesting. Like the, the rock awards, the metal awards, like it's almost this like secret award. Cause you don't, we don't say, see it live as fans. It's like, it happens almost like it happens before. So when you're there, do they do it? Those awards live, but they just don't air it. Is that how well, it works? In a different location. So a majority of the awards are in what they call the pre-telecast, and that's a majority of it. And there's still some substantial awards. They're just not telecast. Like I think the the way that the, the telecast part is so like uh, performance heavy, and which which was an amazing to see. And you know it's just like the the creme de la creme of of whatever is the most you know, I think has the most mass appeal at the time. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know, so they give some of the key type of awards out then, but the overwhelming majority of them are on a pre-telecast in a different location. And it was still, you know, really nice production and really nice to see there were performances there as well, but there were a lot more awards. Wow. Yeah. And just what I know watching it as a fan at home that night, it is, it's a lot of performances. It's a lot of, you know, you get like a handful of awards smattered throughout, but it's like here's another performer, here's another performer, and now we're gonna go up to the st the you know the the roof, and here's people up there performing, yeah. which is pretty wild. Yeah, for for me, it was amazing to see. Um, my wife said something interesting. She's like, you know, in order to see all of these bands, like to pull that together, like if you had to buy tickets or 
and just the logistics of even just them coming through town, what that would mean and to get to see everyone in one thing, even though they're playing a song, you know, was phenomenal. And for me, as a performer, seeing these bands, how great they were live and how powerful it sounded live, everybody, I have, you know, it, it really gave me a profound respect for everyone. Like yeah. whatever I felt about, I felt I liked all of those bands already or the projects or the artists, but like it, everything went up a notch. Mm. As you're seeing that in that environment and seeing how, how just clean and solid and, and, and intense it was, it was super cool. All right. So you mentioned, you know, being at home, working on some stuff, you know, the impetus to have you on is to talk about what you've got going on right now. I mean, we, you, obviously you've had the, the quicksand record that came out last year, but you're, you're starting a new kind of writing production project. What does yeah. that entail? It's a cool project where it's a single base thing. I, it's the idea of like, especially now, like focusing on quicksand and the band that I, you know, is like that I've been with a, a good chunk of my adult life and and all of my career, and being someone who's just kind of like prolific in general, like wanting to write, wanting to do things, wanting to, oh, I'm always home demoing, I'm always doing stuff. And um, one day uh, I was home and my wife on YouTube stumbled uh, upon this producer who has a series of uh, songs that he does with people. He does a song with an artist. It's mostly Latin based. It's all Latin actually. It's like electronic or hip hop, urban, Latin. And she's like, man, that's something that I could see you doing. And it's like a really cool project where you're doing a song with a person, they kind of just capture it on video and it's that moment. And, and I was like, that really resonated with me, especially coming off of, you know, making a couple of albums, having that momentum and always wanting to keep the staying in a flow. So I called up a friend, uh, Chris Enriquez, who is a drummer in the band Spotlights, as well as a solo artist. and. Um, we got to work, you know, he, we, he has a, a, a space, he has access to a recording studio and we started working, we start reaching out to singers, say, Hey, let's just do a song, you know, and the vibe is like, uh, sit down, kind of have a conversation, get a vibe for a song. And then we just get to work. So we have a couple of songs that are, we have one in the can, we have one that's about three quarters and, uh, we just, the, the only name that I'll reveal, cause like, like without putting external pressure is just. They were really excited that uh, we talked to Keith Buckley last week. Oh, nice. oh wow. That's awesome. Yeah, nice. It was, it was our, our first meeting, and we resonated on, uh, a lot, you know, just like our passion for music and, and, just, and just life in general. Like, so the three of us really hit it off, and it was like a really nice electricity. And in the spirit of uh, capturing lightning in a bottle, it started running, ran over to my guitar, and ran over to my setup behind me, and just started getting to work. And like... Uh, Something like that to me is is something that was born from our circumstances, and born from the momentum of of my past few years, and and born from like kind of thinking of ways to be creative, without the burden or onus of like oh we're gonna build up a band we're gonna build up a project like a song, and it's like it's like almost like the the like the first taste of um of a, of a Sunday you know it's like oh, oh my god it's amazing and then you just kind of like that's it you just do it so mm -hmm. nice. we're very excited about that. That's amazing. So Man. the thought is, you guys are like the house band, house band, and you'll have, you'll bring in additional musicians and possibly, possibly because that's just something else that could happen as well. Like if uh, so, currently, you know, with the songs that we've had, I'm doing, you know, the strings, the sims, Chris is playing the drums. We're going back and forth in and and fleshing out the song and with the with the idea of being like really rapid, rapidly and trying to like we always talk about uh, we're going to turn a year into a month. You know, how do you, and for me as a songwriter, it's like, how do you make quicker decisions? How do you develop things faster? Mm. And, and that's part of the excitement. So uh, one of the ideas that I had recently from, from watching kind of like documentaries on music is the idea, yeah, you can actually also, people who do these kinds of things can, you know, you can bring in, you can actually, why stick it to, why stay to a singer? Maybe you can feature a guitar player or somebody who can, maybe do something better or different than you know than i would mm -hmm. so that's that's on the table as well but so far it's just been the two of us composing and laying down the music and we have uh we have our friend uh mario the uh singer of spotlights he mixes and masters it for us nice man this is a controversial subject mainly for the reason that you know 
obviously this is very exciting like we're all stoked i think all fans can agree that it's it's good to use your creative outlet but at the same time it's kind of a Maynard James Keenan type situation. Like, where do you delegate your time? If you were working on a perfect circle and Pussifer and making wine and all these things, maybe quick quicksand, or in his case, obviously, tool, gets pushed aside. How do you delegate that time? Like, what does that mean for quicksand? Is it prearranged? Oh, or? Well, all things inform each other. So okay. the, the, the idea of doing a project like this is that it doesn't take time away. So, and the parameters that are put that I put on myself or that I'm employing tunings and things and modalities that are outside the realm of quicksand. Okay. You know, so it's not like, oh, here's a quicksand, you know, here's a song. It can, right. go, it can go to here. Like, it just wouldn't, you know, and it gives me the freedom to play with tunings that I'm not burdened with having to now have guitars and play live mm -hmm. and use for live and stuff like, like, let's say with Deftones, I was up to six or seven tunings. And you know that it, that that now puts the the burden on you to have those instruments and backups for them for live. Mm -hmm. Quicksand uses two tunings that only require a couple of instruments. We're just changing one string, and so that's kind of how that works. And there's no rehearsals. There's no anything. So when you know Quicksand rehearses, I go. To, you know we do. We work on Quicksand. We work on Quicksand. Walter and or Alan can come to my house. We can jam here. We have the rehearsal space, and. Anything else, I'm picking up a guitar and playing with ideas. Now, if you're staying in the flow, it means to me that that I'm, I'm my time with quicksand and, and my things come faster and quicker and I'm and I'm a better player. And the same for Walter and the same for Alan. You know, like Walter can, is producing bands, he's doing things, he's picking up guitars, he's working with other bands. There isn't the idea of it being a conflict. It's the idea if it actually makes us better uh, with the time that we have and use it use it more efficiently. Yeah, you're you're working different muscles, but in the scheme of trying to keep all of it tight, so you can you know get ideas from different places, I would imagine. In in the sense that, like, let's say, like with Quicksand's first tenure, it could take us a really long time to settle in on a song, and with how we are operating now, and with all of the how we've all progressed, you know, like uh, Walter came over here one day, we had a song that you know in a day. It was wow. not done, but it was like, here's the body of the song that now we can all like, we can evolve as a band and give it the nurturing. But, but you know, the actual impetus went from being like this long thing to being like, here's the past decisions, feel good. This is hot. This is cool. We got it. It's a demo. Send it out to everybody, you know, which is the, you know, the last person being Alan. Then we're going to re, you know, put it through his filter. And, and so we're operating so much faster and better. You know, so I, I do believe in keeping yourself busy. Mm -hmm. As a lifetime quicksand fan, that's like, it brings such a smile to my face. Cause when I look at the, you know, the time between albums, you're always wondering, all right, are they, are they still together? You know, and you guys, have, in my eyes, have turned into a band that I'm like, that band will never be done. You know, so to hear that where things can possibly turn on a dime, it gets me really excited. We're very excited. I think we've never been more excited about music, about the world around us. We have a different appreciation for each other and a reverence for for what we're doing. And and we've learned a lot. You know, like I think being a part as long as we have and the experiences that we had as individuals really, really informed us. So um it's it's a rare occurrence to have something be apart that long and come back together. And it's a rare occurrence to be you know, to have taken part in projects that have uh, either long histories or, long, or a lot of bodies of work, and the newest things are still relevant. You know, those are those uh, those don't come easily. That comes with a lot of care and a lot of love and a lot of openness to to just now. Mm -hmm. And you pulled it off. I mean, I, I think the all four Quicksand albums are without a doubt Quicksand. But you, in my head, I can place the era. Oh, you know. Thank you. I mean, the hardest thing was coming back after 22 years and saying, like, what are we now? Like, we can't, where's the line between who we are now and, and what quicksand is? You know, it'd be silly to be not what you were and, and try to make a third album because, like, you should be up to your eighth album by now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, like, where's that, where's that line? And that, that, it wasn't, there wasn't an issue with writing. There was more an issue with, like, what, what are our parameters? And when we when we finally 
when it congealed and we're like, wow, this is us. It's, it, and we can really say this is quicksand. You know, that made even moving forward, uh, it, it gives you, it gives you uh, affirmation and confidence to move forward and even expand. You know, so mm-hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. it's a nice thing. And I'm glad that you like it. I'm glad that it's appreciated because it, it's, you know, it means a lot. Yeah, no, I mean, we're, we're big fans. <laughs> it's, uh, it's all, and, and not just of the quicksand, just anything you've had your hand in, you know, I, it, we're, we've, we've talked a little bit about um, the quicksand stuff, what you're doing right now and, and being, you know, part of uh, the Deftones camp uh, as the bassist collaborated with them for 10 years. The, the stuff that you did with them, we absolutely love too. I mean, and like you said, being relevant still today for, with a, a group that's been around for 25 years and you've done that you did that with two separate groups like and that's pretty wild for you know no, most people don't get to do it with one so you were able to do yeah. it with two and that's pretty awesome thank you and it's never lost on me you know it's, it's like never lost on me because part of the reason that i have an excitement still for music is because it's just i i get the situation that i'm in and i get it and i appreciate it because i often think about like what uh, the amount of musicians around the world, the amount that get to actually have someone interested in their music, you know, it shrinks down, the amount that gets to play on stage, the amount that gets to make a living, the amount that get to have a career, and then it starts getting smaller and smaller. And there's so many factors, and it's not even about necessarily being the, the, the most shreddingest or the best singer or that, you know, there's so many things that are within and without your control that I appreciate every opportunity to make music or to play a show. And, and I bring that to anything that I do, mm-hmm. you know, so like with getting into, you know, working with Deftones who had, a, who are, were old friends by that point, you know, I had, we met on the first warp Tour, you know, I had filled in for Chi in 99 and to get into, to come in at that, at that crossroads, you know, like to, having that perspective was something that again was not lost on me and something that I had a lot of appreciation and value for and made sure to bring the best of myself. So, I mean, every, everything that you just said makes sense why you would kind of do the, all these bands over the years and then kind of come full circle to this writing and production project. Like it's, you have to, I think you have to be like a really special musician to do that and have, you've done this pocket, done this pocket. And now you're going to, you know, kind of form this, uh, does it have a name? We wouldn't even ask. It, not when the word is, you know, we're just kind of talking like, how do we, you know, like, let's say with Quicksand, I'm, I'm not big on external pressure. I'm not big on putting out uh, things that now you have to like, you know. So Act on, yeah. Like, yeah, but then I'm also not into throwing nothing, you know, nothing burgers out at people or word salads that don't mean anything. So kind of, I'm trying to figure out what was the best thing to say is like, I just want to say that we're working with Keith doing this song thing and then like uh, build excitement around that, get some stuff together. And when we're ready to, to say what it's called, you know, yeah. which to me is secondary to the, to the, what it is. And all, yeah. like, I want it to be, I want it to be uh, further down the line so that we can all, it can be a thing, you know, mm-hmm. you know, I think, I, I don't know how many times we've probably seen people who have t-shirts before their things are together. And then all <laughs> t-shirts. And yeah. <laughs> and we'd buy it. That's a thing. We're, yeah. we're the type that would buy it, you know, <laughs> yep. but it, have, it, it has its own special kind of value. The thing that never existed. Right. <laughs> And so you touched on a few things. Um, we collect everything. Like we have boxes of old shit. Um, I have this telephone flyer, telephone pole flyer. That's actually a Deftones uh, quicksand flyer from 98, I believe, at the State oh, Theater yeah. in Portland, Maine. Mm-hmm. Super rad. And like you said, it, it's like you've known the guys for a while. So you did have a stint with the guys for quite a while. You're a former collaborator uh, with the Deftones. And we loved that phase of the band. I mean, we loved Chi. Uh, he, was a, he was an awesome guy. But when you came to the band, as fans, we were like, there's no better guy for the job. Thank you. And we're just curious, like your story, you know, your backstory, how did it happen? Obviously you said you knew the guys, but there's so many guys. You're basically a Josh Freeze, just like you already have like three other projects and now you're jumping the Deftones camp. Mm-hmm. How'd that come about? It was, it was cool how we met in 95, you know, like I'll try to make it super succinct. Yeah. But, uh, a friend said, Hey, go check out this band. They're cool. And I was kind of still, Kind of in my little hardcore bubble. I was like, are they from the scene or what are they? He's like, they love bad brains. Go check them out. I went and saw them uh, during their the run they did, the leg they did on the on that book tour. And I was like, wow, this has great energy. Like, this is what I signed up for. Met them. We became acquainted, and it was nice. Fast forward a few years, you know, like I get 
a call to fill in for Chief. And, um, you know, like at that point I had known him, you know, I knew the guys, I felt really cool about it. I also had a, a connection with Chi in the sense that uh, he plays Fender basses and the reason he plays them was because he saw me kick a bass across stage and like picked it up with quicksand and it was it's still going and in, in, in tune and, and, you know, like I'm very cathartic and that was something that he brought as well. So him seeing that was like, oh, if this guy's doing this and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm messing with that gear, I'm messing with this. And so there was a mutual, there was a connection, a synergy and a mutual respect and admiration. So when I filled in for him, you know, that was, it was the same thing. It was like, hey, he went home, he's hurt. You know, you bring that excitement, bring that thing. And uh, even to the extent that it was like, you know, kind of kind of rolling and bringing, I always bring everything, you know, and at some point, uh, like, uh, Chino asked me, hey, what if we asked you to join? And I was like, no, you know, like, oh, like, wow. like that's, she's your boy. I mean, this is exciting. This is cool. Rock. You know, that's your guy. Like, I know this is, feels like a, it's a moment, but it's like, it's a moment. You have something great. And that was it, you know, when I was our lives. And then in 99, it came, I'm not in 99, I'm sorry. In 2009, it came around again. And, you know, what happened it was like, is tragic. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and they were kind of like at the tail end of Eros, you know, like, they were starting to get along again. But the album, my, my understanding is that the album wasn't coming together in a way that they were the label like. The label is just going to be like, I don't know. You know, uh, Nick and I came in and they used, uh, my understanding is that they used the money, like severance money that they would have given them to not release that record and just go, you know, we're part ways to fund Diamond Eyes. Mm -hmm. So all of the, between the tragedy and the emotion and everything going on and the excitement that Nick brought and the focus and everything that was like a storm of, of energy that propelled, you know, the writing and recording of Diamond Eyes. That was one of the quickest records that was ever made. And that energy just shot through the next, my uh, next 12 years as a uh, collaborator with them. And that infected even when Quicksand reformed around the time of Cornel Yoken. Oh, wow. And you know, that was, that was the deal. And it's like, I still feel the momentum of it. Yeah, I mean, to be doing the stuff you're doing now uh, and, and putting records out with Quicksand still, and it, it makes sense that you've honed it to make things move a little quicker because you've got the experience that you have. But to, to think like that energy was started so long ago and is still, still there, still going is pretty wild. I mean, we, we love what you did with the band and uh, that era, like Nate said, is one of our favorites that, that 10 years, 12 year stretch starting with diamond eyes. Diamond eyes is so great. Koi, Koi might be my favorite Deftones record. So to have you be part of that is, is then to talk to you about it is pretty wild to me, but uh, yeah. yeah. How do you, how do you feel about the stuff that you, you put out with those guys? Oh, I, it, it gives me, it's interesting and awesome because I, I, in some ways I can be heady and think about like how things work and how you take that and, and use that to inform your next choices. And I thought of like, when I came into the band, I had some weird vision of a triptych, like a lot of my family are visual artists. So I imagine, and when I think of Diamond Eyes, I think of like a boxer on the ropes. And it was a boxer getting off the ropes. And that was the energy that you need, you know, you're kind of going to do something and you have to get up and you have to get yourself back to the center of the ring. And, and then I felt that Koi was, you got your, you know, your, 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 your focus, you got your thing, you're, you're buoyed, you have a little bit of confidence and gore took that further in terms of its experimentation. And for me as a writer and a collaborator with the band in Diamond Eyes, you know, like um, I would like be work myself in and be careful. Like, like so let's say like a song like Diamond Eyes, you know, uh, was a cool example of Nick's influence because Abe and I were jamming out what was the chorus and the, and the bridge of the song as like a loop. And to think of the visual aspect of it it was like the, the poster behind me in my mind i was calling that akira because of the time if the time signature of those two parts the way they undulate and fall on each other reminded me of a scene in akira and and then stefan had the the body of the song the verses and but they were separate entities and nick was like hey i think if you throw that together you got gold mm -hmm. amazing he was about quick 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 yep. go to go to koi you know i felt like a little bit uh 
more like, okay, this is fun and this is cool. And I felt like more established in there to the extent where I could say, oh, here's a whole piece. You know, so here's like something that like became what happened to you is like, here's a whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Tempest, here's a whole thing. You know, and it was funny with that bit because I was just jamming some things in the corner. Uh, Stefan was like, you guys are making noise and don't you hear this guy just wrote a song. And then <laughs> Chino was like, wow, this is cool. I was just imagining what would quicksand sound like now. <laughs> wow. wow. And, and I felt more comfortable in like, what was my voice in quicksand and what was that thing? Cause quicksand, you know, wasn't existing. And I felt a lot more comfortable with that, my, that feel and that touch and applying it in another situation. And I learned something really valuable because I realized that I can, if you bring like a voice to something, it it gets um, pulled in and, and, and nurtured by other people who are doing different things. So like I can say with confidence, you know, you bring a part to one band, it's going to come one way. If you bring a part to the other band, everyone's so creative and they're writers and it goes another way. Mm -hmm. So that was a real fun learning experience. And Gore furthered that, you know, Gore, Gore furthered like, I started using base sixes and I started to be like, you know, we had a lot of confidence and we're expanding our horizons. So with tunings, with, with, with me using a new instrument. And, you know, so that to me is like this triptych. And then when I think of ohms, I think of it as then I'm now moving over to baseball. And that's like, that's like the cleanup hitter, you know, that's everything, yeah. everything that I learned, from, you know, from all of that now quicksand being back together and everything that was going on was like, wow. And just personal changes in my life really, really informed that. Nice. It's uh, it's one thing like we're, you know, obviously massive fans of you, but it's one thing, you know, when it was announced that you were joining the band, you know, 10, 12 years ago, there's obviously a lot of hype, but then it's like, well, well, what are we going to get? And it just, like you said, kind of shot out of a cannon, you know, it exceeded anything that we could have imagined. And then with Koi, I mean, that album, it's just a vibe, the whole aesthetic, visually, every part of it. And um, I'm curious, though, what, what song did that turn into when you were kind of jamming in the corner and oh, Chino was like, oh, it was Tempest. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Tempest. And then would have fun with kind of like, because you're, you know, you're playing so many different tunings, you're doing things that I would kind of have fun throwing like for myself, because now with the understanding that like things get mutated in such a way that that I started to have fun in like how like in video games there can be Easter eggs, mm -hmm. you know, I started to have fun with that in like writing and parts of something like that became Rosemary, you know, like the basis of that song is it's a different tuning, it's a different tempo, but it's it's like delusional. You know, so I was like, that's actually delusional, but kind of like warped. Yep. And it's never going to sound like it because it's all different people. It gets taken a whole different place. But I started to enjoy the idea that and experiment with the idea that things and, and things that I employed, you know, with uh, quicksand and that kind of stuff could find new ways of being expressed in another situation. You mentioned different tunings and having a couple with quicksand, but having like six or seven by the end of your time doing stuff with Deftones. Do you like one more than the other? No, I, it's, it's interesting because, like, at first I would think oh, this is like, why? But right. uh, you realize that, like, oh, I quickly realized that these different tunings have different timbers and different. They're, the same notes are colored differently. So, especially when you have people playing in different tunings, and even if you're all hitting the same note, maybe like something like uh, Swerve City, where we're all kind of playing the same exact thing. Yeah. Or in three different tunings, it, it colors it differently. All, mm -hmm. Everything has a different shade, even though we're playing the same note, and that creates a wider wall. And some people in our camp, even like our, our would notice that. You know, they go, oh, it's interesting. So, and there was never a premeditated thought about it. It was just about uh, this is the tunings we have, and you know. And the fun thing about the arms race of like writing with people who are writing as well, and everyone's kind of like writing. Usually the person who planted the seed of the idea has the easiest time playing it because they're, they're, they're doing it in a good way that's convenient for their tuning and everyone else just has to be like, okay, I got to make this work. Yeah. Yeah. And then the map and the triptych, you said it's in your head already too, probably. So I see where this is going, whereas everybody else is like, where are you going? I'll, I'll follow yeah. you, but where are you going? I got to figure that out. 
<laughs> whoever, you know, like if Stephanie came up with a rip, you know, like something that's an open string for him is not for everyone else, you know, and if it's me, I'm doing this, it, like it's really easy for me to play, but now someone else has to figure it out and be like, oh, how do I, where do I find that? You know, so those things are fun. Those are fun, like unintended aspects of, of creating in that environment. Yeah, there's that dynamic writing, but also transferring those skills to a live set, right? Is there a lot of surprises that come about putting those songs out in, in concert? Like, oh, wow, this is turning out way different than I ever thought would be playing this song live, whether it's technical or... I think uh, by that point, everything's pretty dialed, but like yeah. I, what you... what uh, More in the case of Quicksand, what happens is, is that the songs keep evolving. And usually I think with a lot of bands, I think they don't have the opportunity. You know, you have a, you have a chance to get a song to a certain point, you're, you're committed to a recording, but they're still like they're living. So things kind of, you know, grow and change. With uh, Quicksand is more open to usually playing with rearranging things or, or playing with expectations by, by altering the arrangement slightly. Mm -hmm. Whereas Deftones is just, you know, we're just, we're playing the songs to, to uh, faithful to the recording for the most part. Oh, wow. Occasionally, there's a couple of songs that get flipped around, but Deftones was more about just like staying faithful, usually. It's interesting because like some, sometimes you'll you'll go see bands and they'll be like, well, this is a new song we've been working on. And you remember that version of it. Then the album drops and it's a little different. Yeah. You know, they're, you know, you're, tw you're tinkering with it, uh, you know, in the studio or it's unfinished, but you, you want to get it out there. Yeah. And it's a fun thing. I think um, people are more hesitant. It's changing again. But there was a period of people being very hesitant to to showcase something that wasn't recorded yet. Because you know that playing something live, or not release yet even, like playing something live is tantamount to releasing it now. Mm -hmm. Yep. But I think in the current, with the current cultural shift, people are, there's a, there's a shift towards transparency, taking people along for the ride, and people appreciate seeing the uh, development of an idea. So seeing works of progress, or work in progress as a public affair, and like a community thing is something that people appreciate it. And artists are realizing, hey, this is kind of fun. You know, I'm part of a, I'm part of a collective that's like mostly art based, but has has an audio component in some of the artists. Uh, but but everyone is really like, yeah, like this is fun to show works in progress. Mm -hmm. You know, and maybe even stream the process of doing it. And that's something like Shinoda does. It does a lot of like. Yeah, making beats streaming while streaming and that's you know people you get to realize you don't have to be behind this kind of curtain until it's perfect no i mean that's you're right i see more and more of people showing the process and putting out you know here's where we are right now this may not be its final form but we want to see what people think about it and what you like about it and we want to get it out there because you know this is how it works for us being creative whether it be you know in your own band or by yourself or making beats or making bass lines or any of that stuff. So that's the transparency is definitely there now. You're absolutely right. No, it's fun. And I think, and people get a sense to it, to me, it, it, it reminds me of the things that I, it's a continuation of the things that I liked about like a hardcore scene or any underground scene where you're, you're all around each other. You see each other, you develop a different level of connection because there's a sense of community and it's not, there's not the separation of like artist fan it's more kind of like melted and and uh, you can resonate with someone differently when you have that extra extra points of adhesion. So that was something that really came to a head, you know, during lockdown especially, and I started doing Twitch and people started to really get a sense for who I was. Mm -hmm. And it was something that I didn't, I started to understand how little people knew about me. I love that. I love what you just said, especially because I don't think the fans really care for a perfectly, you know, curated product, you know. Um, I know I mentioned Maynard earlier, but Maynard and Trent Reznor had Tapeworm, and it never came to fruition. Mm -hmm. And then Maynard ended up using one of the songs, Passive, for a perfect circle, and it's a great song. You know, it's like, just release the music. Like, no one, and no one cares for it to be perfect, because there's going to be a fan of that style no matter what. And if anything, it works for commerce, because you'll see, you know, Spotify spins or whatever, based on those tracks and no matter what that's going to cater to someone someone's going to like it so yeah and i even think like outside of the like business side of it the kind of like the i feel like the state of the world is such that we have more connectivity than ever we're, we're sitting here together 
we have more isolation than ever. Mm -hmm. And I think what's being valued now is authenticity in a way where I think there's always going to be a place for mysticism and there's always a place for things that are larger than life. And so I don't think it's any one thing, but um, for certain situations, letting people underneath the hood or behind the curtain, I think is very much appreciated. Mm -hmm. It gives people an opportunity to relate to anyone on a, on a better level, whether it be a musician or an artist or just a person, you know, anything, getting to see those aspects of their lives or something that is helpful, especially now. But, you know, there's still a place for, I think that the things that are like, I'm the man on the mountain, you don't know anything about me, like this is, larger. that's cool too. You know, it's all, it's all circumstantial or situational. It, it takes the right person to pull or band to pull that off too. Yeah, it depends on the circumstances, you know, what's going on. Yeah, and you kind of mentioned it earlier, like the transparency aspect, like we're fans of music. You know, we bought every music magazine on the stands from Circus and Hip Parader to Rolling Stone, but at the end of the day, like, we weren't reading the questions that we wanted to, or the answers we wanted to know. Right. Like that, it was just wasn't out there. So we we're like, fuck it, we'll do it ourselves. So we have the <laughs> platform to do it now. Whereas before, it was like, hopefully, spin a, a magazine or you know, alternative press will ask the right questions. But no, it's always the same format, you know, mm -hmm. and it gets a little boring over time. And I, I'm assuming it gets kind of boring for you guys too. I think it's it. A lot of it depends on the investment of the people in the conversation. Yeah. And I think it's really cool. Like you guys are invested in it, right? So you have a power and that, that, that shapes things, yeah. you know, I think, and I think you could say the same for artists that you talk to, you know, there could be someone who's just mailing it in or someone who's just like, whatever. And then that makes, that doesn't make for a good connection. Right. You know, and, and for me, you know, it could be the person who's doing an interview for, of you who's not really interested or doesn't care about either you or even being an interviewer. It was just kind of a thing. So, right. I, you know, that, that makes sense. So these things are not boring inherently. It's just a chance to talk and process music, which is like my uh, favorite thing in the world. Yeah. And the longer form, you know, the, the five minutes, it's going to be in print or it's going to be in Rolling Stone is cool. And it, it served its purpose at the time or even a radio hit. But this longer form podcast stuff has, has certainly, I think, pulled back that curtain a lot more and in different places that never saw that before. And, and mm -hmm. I'm super happy that we get to do it. Uh, and I'm glad that uh, yeah. somebody like you was able to come on and talk with us. Well, I appreciate it. I mean, you guys do it well. It's fun to talk. So Thank you. Uh, it's a fun conversation that makes it you know, feel comfortable and, and you guys know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, appreciate that. So, Sergio, uh, you know, you, you mentioned the writing production project. Obviously, it sounds like maybe Quicksand has something going on. So, if we were fans of you, where would we fo Where should we focus our attention? You know, what what can we kind of keep an eye out on, or eye out for? Well, Quicksand's always my first home. Yeah, <laughs> that is my home. You know, and and everything else is. I take everything seriously, and I don't know. I'm kind of online. I'm available. You know, it's, I'm always down to talk. Always down to chop it up. Awesome. Awesome, Sergio. You nailed it too. You said you take everything seriously and down to this interview, to the music and the way you perform as fans, we definitely appreciate all of it. So thanks for coming on tonight. We really, uh, or this afternoon for that matter. Thank you. I appreciate every opportunity. I appreciate this one a lot. So thank awesome. you. Thanks, Sergio. All right. Wait. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. That was our conversation with Sergio Vega of Quicksand, uh, his new endeavor where he's you know he's pulling in some big names to help him out with that that'll be fun i i can't wait to hear what they've got to, uh, in the hopper with with uh, keith buckley i mean damn that that's oh, exciting stuff hot damn yeah it is it's uh you know keith is uh, currently uh you know apart from every time i die so we'll see what comes from that you know and who knows maybe it could turn into something more than just a one-time thing you know the, my, the wheels are spinning as he was talking which is like all right, well, how frequent is he going to do this? Who's going to collaborate, you know? Uh, but as music nerds as we are, that's something I'm going to check out, especially with him involved. And, you know, if Keith is, you know, tip of the iceberg, it's like, well, well, who's next? Mm -hmm. Yeah, fresh off the press. We get, we always get some, like, new tidbits on this podcast, which is music to our ears as nerds. Like, oh, shit, where are we first to market with this? Oh, this is cool. Secondary to that, off air, we were talking about the fact that we have our house bands on here, uh, namely Deftones and Foo Fighters and a bunch of bands. But uh, we're starting to get those members on the podcast, which when we first put this together, we never thought this would ever happen. So, um, And even Quicksand, for that matter, like, you know, the bands that influence the bands like Deftones. So um, it's really becoming something bigger than we thought. I think we always 
are starting to be able to relate with the talent where it's like, oh, wow, like I, I set to do this out of passion, but I didn't think it was going to become a thing where I was headlining a, a world tour. Not that we're at that level, but the fact that we're getting guests on that, like we might meet outside of the venue, at least me, uh, trying to get autographs, but like <laughs> yeah, to right. bring him in long format to talk the intro to Deftones or the legacy of Quicksand. It's, just, it's really kind of, I'm kind of beside myself in the fact that like, I didn't think this was possible really. But it was, and we did it. And uh, yeah. hey, we were we're here for any of these conversations. We love talking to people that share in our kind of nerdery aspect of of how things work and the how and the why. As Tuan always says, the how and the why. We want to know what happened, how it happened, why it happened, and not just oh, that's a cool song. I'm on to the next thing. Like a lot of people, we we want to dig deeper on that, and that's what you're gonna get here from us. And, and I mean, we've been doing it now for. Uh, two plus years, 111 episodes, and we got more in the hopper, man. We're, we're going to keep rolling. Yeah, it, I, I I agree. Uh, someone like that, and as I as I told him, I mean, I've had a quicksand poster on the wall for years, you know, and to chat with him, it's it's. Uh, I mean, that discography is is untouchable. Slip in a minute, compression interiors was a great comeback album, and then distant populations from last year was. Uh, I actually forgot to put in my top uh, releases for some reason, but it, it was definitely up there. So to chat with him, you add in the Deftones legacy, which is kind of cherry on the top. I mean, most people would be satisfied with the quicksand legacy alone. Mm -hmm. Yep, It's a full circle nerd moment for us. It's It's an exciting thing. Never thought it would happen, but here we are. All right. So hit us up, audioslave.com. Uh, at Potty Slave, Twitter, Instagram, all the socials that you can find. And, uh, you know, the DMs are open and all that fun stuff. And and hit us on Gmail if you want, Podcast at gmail.com. Uh, I know that we are pretty active there. I, I, it may take us a day or three to answer you, but we will answer you because <laughs> uh, we love this stuff and we love to nerd out. So thank you guys for checking us out. And, uh, you know, we'll be back next week with more, and you're going to love it. I'm, I'm telling you right now, it's going to be pretty badass again. Yeah, nerds, brace yourself for more nerdery. It's on. We're fucking stoked, and it, and it's the. I feel like we're on this really crazy train right now in terms of uh, talent and just uh, we're on just an amazing ride. The cadence right now is in, insane. I'm happy to be back, and uh, yeah, tune in because uh, it's it's getting better by the moment. So it's really cool. See you next week, everyone. Peace, podheads. Peace. Cheers. Peace.